Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. This episode starts a new series around open source cloud architecture. Today, we'll discuss cloud management and spotlight a few open source options for managing your infrastructure. All that and more on the Pseudo Show. Welcome to the Pseudo Show, your home for all things enterprise open source. I'm Eric, the IT guy, and joining me every episode is the evil cloud scientist, Brandon Johnson. How are you doing today, buddy? Doing well, Eric. It's been busy all this week, and right now I'm missing getting in front of customers face-to-face. Ironically, I'm like missing being on planes. (laughs) Probably something no one has ever said before, but I'm missing uh, getting on a plane. (laughs) <laughs> I definitely echo that sentiment. <laughs> yeah, just this week there could have been uh, there were just uh, meetings that would have been way more effective if I was in a room with the with the customer. But you know, it is what it is. On a personal note, I pre-ordered the Pine Phone, and I'm hitting refresh every day on on Lenovo's web page, waiting for the ThinkPad X1 to show Fedora as an option <laughs> since uh, Nest with Fedora ended. So I, I saw all the hype around Nest. Uh, I've been playing a bit of catch up the last week or two, so I didn't catch any any of Nest live. Uh, did you catch any of the sessions? Uh, just uh, the one around uh, the ThinkPads. <laughs> well, knowing you, that, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> what about you, Eric? How are you? Well, the move is more or less behind us. Uh, so the past couple of weeks, like I said, I've been playing catch up on errands and chores and never ending list of, of video conferences and, and emails. But uh, now that things are starting to quiet down a little bit, our, our last episode uh, on learning actually got me excited. Uh, I'm actually thinking about getting deeper into uh, Agile and, and possibly pursuing even my Scrum Master certification. That's a great certification to get, especially if you're considering uh, moving into product or project management. While I'm getting deeper with Agile, it's time for each of you to get deeper into one of my favorite companies, Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is also a proud sponsor of the Pseudo Show and the entire Destination Linux network. So head on over to bitwarden.com DLN to see all that they have to offer. Pseudo Show loves to promote open source projects. Bitwarden is definitely one of those favorites. You may wonder why having an open source password manager would be important. It makes a huge difference. Since Bitwarden's code is public, anyone can review it and see exactly what's going on under the hood. But Bitwarden didn't stop there. They offer a bug bounty program and have a commitment to regular third-party security audits, the results of which are proudly posted on their website. You get a great user experience with documented security. Start for free or unlock even more amazing features for just $10 a year by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN. And thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show and the whole Destination Linux network. Also, don't forget to head on over to pseudo.show slash shirt to buy your very own pseudo show t-shirt. It's a great way to level up your nerd skills. You can grab your choice of colors and sizes. Then when it arrives, take a selfie and post it to social media and be sure to tag us at pseudo show podcast. So today we start a multi-episode arc around cloud architecture, and today we're going to talk about cloud management tools and how to orchestrate your workloads using open source tools. Cloud management is a complicated topic. Generally, if you only use one public cloud provider or single on-premise infrastructure as a service solution like OpenStack, you don't need to think about it too much. Cloud management is handled by using the native tools in those environments. Sadly, only having one public cloud provider and only one IaaS solution in your environment is not reality. I deal with customers with three different virtualization products, open source or otherwise, OpenStack environments from different vendors, and or they're on different versions of OpenStack and have workloads running in AWS, GCP, and Azure, and for fun, maybe even the IBM cloud. <laughs> that sounds like a management nightmare. What is worse is when IT isn't even aware of workloads running on the public cloud. Yeah, Eric, that that's known as shadow IT. You know, basically shadow IT happens when the business or development gets tired of waiting on IT to deliver an environment for them. This brings its own challenges, especially when dealing with uh, customers in regulated industries. 
Yeah, I've, I've worked for companies in the past who have had entire shadow applications. It's painful because all it takes is, is for a manager to pull out his corporate credit card and away you go. The downside is that it doesn't allow for IT as a whole to collaborate or even identify that a problem exists internally. If your shadow application is compromised and it, it calls calls home, if it calls back to, to your local data center uh, for, for customer data or something, you've, you've essentially compromised your entire network and IT operations isn't even going to have a clue what's going on because this, this entire application, this entire workflow has been developed outside of the IT process. So, Brandon, I know this is an area you're very passionate about uh, and, and, uh, and have had quite a bit of experience with. How, how would you describe cloud management from a high level? Cloud management is basically a way of managing the life cycle of cloud resources. These can be compute resources such as VMs, network services like load balancers or DNS resources, storage such as block or object core tenet of cloud management that may sound familiar from our DevOps episodes and will become a theme in nearly every topic uh, that we talk about is automation. You have infrastructure as code tools like Ansible or Terraform, and those can be used to manage the life cycle of cloud resources, and they are platform agnostic. I personally prefer platform agnostic tools like Ansible or Terraform for one reason, you don't get stuck on a single cloud technology. Working with platform-specific technology, open source or otherwise, gets you stuck in multiple operating models. Terraform and Ansible do require you to use uh, platform-specific modules, but it is a common language across different platforms if you're operating a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud environment with uh, resources on-prem and resources in the public cloud. These tools make it much more flexible to manage the life cycle of those resources across those many footprints. Well, and and you mentioned Terraform and Ansible specifically, but those two tools are are, are designed fairly similarly. In fact, they they almost complement one another in, in what they're designed to do and, and how they operate. So if, if you're trying to move from deploying resources with Ansible to Terraform, you're still talking about a YAML configuration file. You're just talking about maybe a few different keywords that are different. The the format may be slightly altered, but you're you're talking about changing a YAML file from one variation to another versus going from one cloud provider's proprietary GUI interface to a whole different proprietary cloud GUI interface. Yeah. Uh, and I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for saying something like you use a, don't use a platform specific tool, um, especially since I'm a big proponent of using the right tool for the right job. But in this case, I'm all about using the platform agnostic tooling versus say using heat templates in OpenStack or cloud formation templates in AWS simply because cloud formation templates are not portable and the knowledge on utilizing cloud formation templates is not portable across different clouds. The knowledge of using Ansible and Terraform is portable across any environment. You know, this, this conversation takes me back to to meetings I, I had with customers as a solutions architect back at GitLab. It's about this point in the conversation where, where the customer to be would say, yeah, all that cloud stuff is great for those startups or, or unicorns like Netflix. None of that stuff really applies to us. We've got more legacy debt than the U.S. government has financial debt. <laughs> I joke about it, but it's true. I mean, I've had this conversation time and time again. Many companies out there don't think that they can utilize cloud or automation uh, on their legacy environments. So how, how would you, in that, in that situation, address their concerns? Yeah, well, it's going to depend on your definition of cloud. Sadly, I think there's a couple definitions. Well, dare I say the only definition that's actually correct is cloud is just using someone else's hardware. <laughs> I don't want to go that far because sometimes you're building your own cloud. Then that's just a private cloud. Yeah. I don't look at cloud as only operating at scale. It's about knowing what you have and better utilizing what your resources. When using the public cloud, containing your costs is paramount. You don't want your AWS spend to get out of control. And that's really easy to do if you are not managing it properly. Extending uh, the infrastructure as code tools are, are cloud management platforms. Those can help you understand what you are running on premise and in the public cloud, I've been playing with a few of these tools that fall into this category of uh, CMP, one of which I've worked with for years. 
So obviously inventory is a, a big deal. You want to know what you're running, where, and and as a bonus, you know how much it's costing. But I mean that's just inventory. I mean there's software that that handles inventory very well. So what what makes a CMP different than than just an inventory management system? Well, this is my opinion of of what a CMP should do. Not only does a CMP go beyond inventory, it is also monitoring and metering and automation and orchestration all in one tool. A CMP uh, should only ever use published APIs and be completely agentless. You should be able to remove a CMP from an environment without that removal of the CMP being destructive to your environment. Most of the proprietary CMPs I've seen in the market expect a green field or they force you to onboard into the CMP. It's not a good looking way of onboarding a cloud management platform. Good CMPs discover what you have and discover what you deploy, whether you deploy it through the CMP or not. CMPs should be able to integrate with anything through published APIs and automate anything, whether it's through scripting in Python or Ruby or using Ansible or Terraform. So to clarify, um, you mentioned uh, Greenfield, and there are a lot of CMPs out there that are not equipped to do any discovery. So with with a Greenfield tool, what you're looking at is if you want the CMP to manage a particular server or, or instance, you have to actually provision that, that server or instance through the CMP. Otherwise, it, the cloud management platform won't acknowledge it, it even exists. Yep. So we all love open source, but beyond, say, an Ansible or a Terraform, most most of the time when you think about cloud management, you're you're you expect to be locked into whatever the cloud provider has. But but you showed me the light, Brandon. You showed me that there were actually open source options out there. What uh, what open source CMPs have you found? So I think there's a ton of confusion what a CMP actually is. OpenStack and a project that many people may not have heard of, Apache CloudStack, very similar to OpenStack in terms of implementing a private cloud, different technology, but the approach is very similar. You know, they get described as CMPs. Quite frankly, I don't think they meet the definition of a CMP. Granted, they can manage multiple hypervisors, but they don't manage public cloud. Makes sense. So the three that stood out to me were Mist, Cloudify, and Manage IQ. So I'm going to start with Mist. I actually came into this uh, platform very skeptical. I, looking at the documentation, I thought it was going to be pretty limiting, but uh, it was very easy to set up and configure. Mist uh, supports several different public cloud providers. I know a lot of people in our community use DigitalOcean. It supports DigitalOcean supports uh, Linode, also apparently supports IBM Cloud, and it also supports Amazon, and that one I did test. It also supports uh, OpenStack for on-premise and LibVirt Managed KVM, and I always differentiate that because there's Proxmox and Overt Managed KVM. So I had to discover a single node KVM server I have in my lab and my DigitalOcean account. Uh, the first dashboard shows you your public cloud spend, which is great. Uh, it allows you to provision and destroy your infrastructure right there as well. But what's really great is I went in, I deployed a droplet on DigitalOcean, and I put a retirement date on it. So, and it tore it down. And uh, as soon as uh, that retirement date hit, it was uh, two hours after I provisioned it. I just wanted to see if it would uh, deprovision the droplet. What's great about that is that I can spin up a project that I'm just toying with with through Mist and just have and have uh, the platform automatically terminate the project. So if I forget to terminate the droplet, I don't get charged for it later down the line, especially if it's something I'm not toying with. If I bring it up and go, oh yeah, this looks great. And I always forget to terminate the droplet. Even though the instances are you know only five to $10 a month, that'll still add up. I've actually implemented Mist as part of my home lab now uh, to help me keep track of my public uh, cloud costs. And, and keep those down. Another cool aspect of it is it uses Ansible uh, for automation. So I feel right at home. You know, I, as I said earlier, installation of the pro of the project is pretty easy. Uh, there's uh, it's uh, deployed as a Docker container. And it's really easy to get going. Yeah, I actually hadn't heard of Mist until we started doing research for this episode, and I'm I'm really hooked on the idea now. I I wish I would have had this <laughs> all along. 
because like you, I've, I've spun up large droplets with large disks to try and, you know, spin up a Nextcloud instance or something. And then you, you get sidetracked with, with a kid or, or um, you, you get fed up with, uh, with MariaDB not spinning up your, your database the way you think it should. And you, you walk away and then you come back on Monday and realize that that big droplet has been running all weekend doing nothing. With Mist.io, I mean, just looking at their, was just looking at their website during the pre-show. There, there's an open source option. There's, there's self-hosted. There's cloud hosted. There's, there's three different ways that you can that you can run Mist.io, and and that, that's from either a Docker container or from their platform. But, uh, so it's really easy to get started, and the and the UI looks amazing and really intuitive as well. Yeah, the UI was very intuitive. It was is a very low learning curve. If anyone is really, if they're especially if they're using one of the uh, supported public cloud providers like DigitalOcean, you should definitely give it a try. The next one, uh, actually, apparently, Mist.io uh, integrates with the with the next one, and this is called Cloudify. Sadly, though, I could not get this to work. Despite that, to me, it still looks interesting. However, it does break my uh, rule uh, in a CMP, and that is it uses an agent. Nonetheless, I'd love to get this working because I'd love to see how it implements uh, Tosca. No, I mean agents are are kind of a pain, but it, nowhere near what they used to be. Nowadays, some of the some of the tools that I use that require an agent, uh, I just uh, create an Ansible playbook to configure those agents when I when I spin up the uh, when I do the initial bootstrap on of a new instance. But Cloudify, I had heard of, um, and I'm I'm eager to give it a shot with uh, my existing instances. Yeah, if you get it working, let me know because I I'd love to get it working and. This is one of the few open source CMPs that I've noticed implements uh, Tosca. And for those who are not familiar with Tosca, basically yet another format to describe infrastructure. It's uh, sponsored by the Oasis Foundation, originally really targeted at telco use cases, but it can really be used in any, it really any type of environment. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to give both Mist and Cloudify a a shot as as I start to build out some small servers here here at home, but also integrate with the uh, with my cloud uh, services on DigitalOcean as well. But this is this is the part of the show, Brandon, that you've been asking me about since we decided to launch the episode. <laughs> You've wanted to talk about this project since before day one, before the show had a name. You've been wanting to tell people about Manage IQ. So why don't so here here you have it, folks. Manage IQ from Brandon Johnson. People who don't know, I, I have been passionate about this project even after it's uh, it it was the upstream of one of our products uh, at Red Hat called CloudForms. Even though it is no longer a, a product from Red Hat, Manage IQ is. Still a very active project, and I still love it. I still think it's a, a very important open source project. So I've been working with it for about eight years now, and it keeps getting better. So Manage IQ versus Mist, I mean, the learning curve is, is going to be huge versus Mist IO. Just put that uh, right up front. That's because uh, Manage IQ is way more complex. Mist by far supports more public cloud providers, whereas Manage IQ supports the big three, so AWS, Azure, and GCP. And it looks like, uh, according to their uh, to the roadmap, uh, IBM Cloud will be coming in a later release. In terms of on-premise providers, it supports OpenShift, Kubernetes, Kubevert, Overt, OpenStack, VMware, and Hyper-V. Manage IQ has a custom cost modeling, doesn't pull current pricing from uh, the public cloud like Mist does. That's one of the things that I thought was really cool about Mist is it actually pulls the price for, of the instance that you're using from the APIs in the cloud. In Manage IQ, you need to build the cost tables yourself. Automation in Manage IQ is so awesome. You have your choice of using really any language, but the two main ones uh, that you're going to see out there are Ansible and Ruby. Ruby is the original automation language for Manage IQ, and Ansible can be used instead, uh, either using the uh, embedded Ansible capabilities, or you can integrate with uh, Ansible Tower. The premise behind automation in Manage IQ is there's uh, pre-work, before you create a virtual machine or a cloud instance or anything else that Manage IQ manages and post work after you create the virtual machine. So it sounds like if if I understand you correctly, I can use Manage IQ to spin up a virtual machine 
And then after that machine is live, I could kick off, say, my default Ansible playbook that spins up all my all my user accounts and deploys my SSH keys. Do I have that right? Yeah, exactly. Let's uh, do an example here. So with on-premise architecture, before you provision a VM, you need an IP address and probably a DNS entry. You need a, uh, so you need to build some automation to retrieve an IP address from an IP address management solution like Netbox or PHP IPAM. And you need to register the host name and IP address on your DNS server. After those steps are complete, you can have a uh, managed IQ provision the machine. If I'm deploying a VM on over using a template, I could take this information that managed IQ retrieved, whether that's based on user input or programmatically uh, retrieving from, from different sources and populate the cloud init file with the IP address and the host name. After the VM is provisioned, take some post steps to run automation to register the VM so it gets updates and register that VM to a directory service like Free IPA and install software uh, that was based on maybe that user input that was in a form. Assuming you coded everything correctly in your automation, <laughs> you can build additional automation to retire this and clean up, say, your directory service, IPAM and DNS. With automation across different clouds, you can customize attributes to, to identify link linkages between different services across multiple clouds. It is a very powerful but very complex tool. Yeah, but will it do my laundry for me? Does it have an API? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nowadays they may. I, I, I haven't exactly checked. So we all know my home infrastructure is in a starry state. Uh, it's been a goal of mine the past couple of months to get back into it. But, uh, you know, hey, moving and, and family and things. But these tools sound honestly amazing and could really help my use case. I still plan on running the bulk of my infrastructure on DigitalOcean, but some applications would benefit greatly from being closer, like having a media server in-house. So I plan to host those here at home. One day, when we have when we finally built our house and, and I have a dedicated office, it'll be glorious. But uh, around that point, I'm planning on having a home hardware lab again. Uh, you know, we could get into the conversations of ROI and, and whatnot, but for now, that's that's what it is. So at that point, I would love to have this in place and have automation that would spin up my servers at home and then use DigitalOcean as a backup. That being said, if you had to pick one of these three today without any prior experience, which direction do you think you'd go? So no prior experience, I'm definitely going to say mist.io. It is so easy to get going. The barrier to entry is just, it's a no-brainer. Now, now, I have very complex workflows. I use my home lab not just for personal tinkering. I also use it to build demos for customers. And I use Manage IQ to build those out. I have all the workflows right inside of Manage IQ. And there, there's a lot of uh, great automation today that's, that's out there on GitHub. Some of it I have written, some of it others have written. So I know I can go find automation that's built for Manage IQ, as well as the whole plethora of Ansible playbooks and roles. But the, I can say the same for Mist.io. The orchestration in Mist.io is just not that complex. Uh, I, I feel like I need something a little more complex. But it does do great job for what it does. But Manage IQ is still my tool of choice. So Manage IQ for a complex workflow and Mist for for those new to the cloud management space. Yeah, definitely. But what I what I love about Mist IO is is it supports more public cloud providers, and I'm you know it's I'm starting to take a look at those. I've never touched Linode ever, so I, now I'm gonna go take a look at it. Well, and and it's it's hard sometimes to find some of these some of the more enterprise grade tools that'll support some of your smaller VPS providers like your Digital Oceans and your Linodes. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Mist supports those already is is highly encouraging. Well, after I started playing with uh, Mist and all the public cloud providers that it, that it supports, I started looking into uh, how do I integrate Mist with Manage IQ. So <laughs> that's starting to sound like cloud management inception, if if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, it does a bit, but uh, it's a uh, it's something I'm always uh, tinkering to to expand the, the capabilities in my uh, home lab. So you you got to stop teasing us, Brandon. Why don't you give us a Why don't you give us a a preview of of what's to come? So this episode has been full of information. So I am building some video and written tutorials around Mist.io and Manage IQ. So look out for those on the Destination Linux YouTube channel and front page of Linux. 
We'll definitely let you know when all that content's available, along with a couple of the other projects we're working on in our secret lab. I've got some content that's, that's coming out here before too long. Meantime, I want to thank you all for joining us. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss to join the conversation. If you want to be kept up to date on the show and all of our other content releases, you can find it over at pseudo.show and on Twitter at pseudoshowpodcast. You can catch more awesome content over at our network partners, DestinationLinux.network. Lastly, we need your help to grow the Pseudo Show. We're a new show, and there's a lot of content out there to choose from. So please head on over to iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your content and leave us a review. It'll help others find our show. Uh, We know there's a lot of content out there to choose from, so we want to thank you for spending time with us every couple of weeks. We truly appreciate it. Brandon, anywhere else you want to send some folks? You can follow me on Twitter at dbrandonjohnson or my website, open-tech.net. And you can follow me at ITGuyEric or on ITGuyEric.com. Remember, the Pseudo Show is your place for all things enterprise open source. Until next time.